Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them, I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. In the spotlight is Cormac McCarthy, the famed novelist who died on June 13th of this year at age 89. He died at his home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. A long, distinguished career. Also in the spotlight, though, during this episode is Cormac McCarthy scholar Stephen Fry. He is an author, uh, a professor of American literature and chairman of the English department at California State University at Bakersfield his books include titles such as Understanding Cormac McCarthy, uh, The Cambridge Companion to Cormac McCarthy, and Cormac McCarthy in Context. And Stephen's even written one of his own novels, which we'll get to in a little bit. He's a boilermaker as well, having graduated with his PhD from Purdue University. His primary fields of study were American literature. Uh, well, that was actually the primary field of study, but he also uh, studied American uh, romance tradition, the literature of the American West, studied composition. He's also a graduate of Cal State Northridge with degrees in English and business administration. Stephen Fry, thank you for coming on the program. Thanks for having me, Mike. Explain to us Cormac McCarthy's significance and greatness. Obviously, I, there's so many different authors out there who you could have uh, spent your time really studying and writing about living and dead. Cormac McCarthy is a guy I think you focused in on more than anybody else. Why is that the case? Well, I, I think there's there's a lot to say about McCarthy's significance. Uh, he's like like any author. They partic- Our traditions are multiple and uh, and polyvalent, and he participates in a tradition that we can associate with, uh, as you mentioned, the American. Uh, romance tradition. And that tradition goes back to the early 19th century. And in that context, you have authors like Melville and Hawthorne and uh, an ancillary kind of contributor to a broader romance tradition might be Dostoevsky. And what is significant about McCarthy is that he engages in asking and inviting us to consider some of the deepest, most profound questions that have ever confronted human beings since we started painting on cave walls. And that is, why are we here? Is there such a thing as God? Can we speak in terms of meaning, purpose, and value? He invites us to ask those questions. He doesn't presume to answer them. But he makes them, uh, or the act of answering them, and the act of uh constantly and perpetually considers considering them a very sort of rewarding thing because he renders the questions and his provisional answers in such beautiful prose and in such profound expression uh and i think that that you know we we i would put him in the camp i also have studied spent many years studying herman melville and who happens to be mccarthy's favorite author moby dick his favorite book and in that context, he he really is um, what um, what we might call a man who dives, uh, and he dives so um, deeply into these profound questions and renders them with such an exquisite and unique prose that uh, it really marks him out. You know, I think it's Milan Kundera who said something to the effect of the brilliance of the novel is asking questions, not uh, providing answers. And, and, right. and to that extent, you, you you were referring to how Cormac McCarthy poses these big questions, eternal questions, really, and uh, without presuming to, to know the answers. To what extent do you feel that uh, of the influences in his life, you've named some of them, uh, Herman Melville, chief among them, it sounds like, to what extent does do you hear those echoes in his writing versus Cormac McCarthy having having blazed his own path? 
and and really uh, come up with pros that were really distinctive. Right. That's a that's a, a very important question to ask. And, you know, I've been on a number of, of podcasts and interviews where I, I often will chart that influence. And part of that has to do with my own training, as you mentioned, in the 19th century. So I see those kinds of threads in ways that others will not perhaps emphasize. But what I would say is, uh, and the way I would contextualize talking about, about McCarthy blazing his own path, is that he is what T.S. Eliot would call a traditional author. And that is an author with historical sense. Um, in his famous essay, that is Eliot's famous essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, he talks about what the genuinely great new contributor to the tradition is. And he says that he, that person is the person with historical sense that has absorbed the tradition into his bones and out of that builds something new. So the, tr the tradition itself is not a structure that is being built upon so much as it is as it is a constantly changing organic entity that is transformed from uh, by the entry of the new work. McCarthy is, is, is utterly distinctive. You can read him without even thinking necessarily about the influence of others. But at the same time, um, it's impossible for me as a person who does work on Melville and Poe, it's impossible for me to read them the way I used to read them before I read McCarthy. McCarthy has changed them just as they have influenced him. So I would emphasize, and to those who are, in, uh, are interested, it's a very um, important essay in, in early 20th century criticism. That is T.S. Eliot's tradition in the individual talent and the idea of the of what of that tradition uh, rightly understood is in fact innovative. So that's the best way I could put it. He has changed the authors that have influenced him, or at least our reading of them, by virtue of his work. How did uh, McCarthy develop his craft? I mean, obviously, he did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we all develop the craft to some extent. Did he have any um, any principles, any, any uh, regimen that he followed that you know of that really brought his craft to to fruition well the first thing i would do is i would i would plug uh my my friend and colleague diane loose for this because she's written a book recently if those are uh, who are interested um that uh that deals precisely with his early development in in those those early years it's called embracing vocation uh, and what we know about McCarthy um, is present in the archives in San Marcos, uh, where we see that he developed early on as a student, um, and he uh, he famously did not graduate from the University of Tennessee, but he was just short of it, uh, and he won a couple of awards there. So he learned to write to some extent in an academic context, but not necessarily in the context of what we might call a creative writing environment. Uh, it was very much in the context of uh, studying literature, working uh, with the literature itself and absorbing the literature, and then trying it out on his own. What we can say about him, and, we ha and this is very clear from his early interactions with his first editor, Albert Erskine, that there was a lot of collaboration that went on there and genuine collaboration. It wasn't like uh, Erskine told him, uh, told the new young author who was just dying to be published that uh, he should make these changes and the author slavishly makes the changes. No, the, the correspondence reveals McCarthy accepting and resisting uh, and transforming those comments and a genuine collaborative relationship took place that I think would, would it's safe to say, was instrumental in his early development, uh, particularly as he wrote his first novel, The Orchard Keeper. So it's, uh, I think it's very much uh, collaborative in that intimate sense with his editor, but uh, but not collaborative in the, in the sense uh, that many authors are coming out of MFA programs uh, and they those kinds of programs have their own value and merit and produce certain kinds of writing and a certain kind of ethos. That wasn't McCarthy's. And he's frankly confessed some skepticism of, of being taught to write. He does see it as something that one has to um, do on one's own through just vigorous uh, and, and concerted effort. Now, you mentioned The Orchard Keeper. That, that takes us all the way back to 1965. Then in 1968, he wrote Outer, Outer Dark. In 1973, Child of God. 
And then in 1979, am I pronouncing this right? Is it Sutri? Sutri is Sutri. It, yeah. Sutri. And, uh, you know, Dwight uh, Garner of the New York Times Book Review uh, called them bleak fables set in the Appalachian South. Uh, now, uh, he, he had a t- taste for violence. His writing had a taste for violence. Uh, w- were his books, I guess, I guess I've got a two part question here. Let me try to divide this out. When right. you look back at those first four novels, uh, Stephen, and then you look at um, where I think all the pretty horses may have been the big turning point for him, where he kind of exploded on the scene and and maybe entered the the apex of his career. I mean, uh, you know, check me on that. You are uh, right. But is that right? So, yeah. how, when you look look at his later writing, really his big books, the ones that people can just rattle off, versus the first four, how big an echo do you see in the later writing uh, when compared to the first writing, or do you see any stark departures there? You know, I wouldn't call the departures stark. Um, it, there is arguably a kind of softening um, when we move from uh, particularly Sutri and Blood Meridian into All the Pretty Horses. I think it's an honest sense of um, perspective that he's developing perhaps as he gets older. Um, but again, it's it's really quite subtle. His emphasis on the uh, innate uh, violence and potential depravity of the world remains all the way to the end. Um, and his focus on on everything from necrophilia early on to suicide in his last novel uh, or two novels, um, you know, really point to to the challenges that that life presents us from a whole host of different angles. But so it's not a stark departure, but we it's very it's easier to read him in a kind of nihilistic vein when you're reading something like Blood Meridian. I don't think that's a nihilistic novel. Let me be very, very clear. I think that's the wrong reading, but it's an easier thing to, to at least uh, try to claim in Blood Meridian than it is in All the Pretty Horses. And especially what I think is a novel that is uh, sort of underread, but needs to be uh, needs to be revisited is The Crossing. Uh, perhaps one of his most philosophically portentous novels, maybe his most philosophically portentous novel. So there's a softening, a balancing of perspective, but McCarthy remains um, rooted in a kind of naturalism. And that is a belief, as he said himself in his first interview, a belief that, um, that there is no such thing as life without bloodshed. But one of the things that he says, and an example of this softening uh, appears in his novel, um, all, all the pretty horses, right? Uh, and he talks about a flower, and he talk he talks about how the world's heart beats at a terrible cost, but the compensation for that cost is the vision of the single flower, right? So that while there is all of this violence right down at the core, at at a microscopic level in in the world. There is also this bloom, uh, and that bloom is not only something that um, that is the flower itself, but it is many of the human relationships and the communities we build and develop. That sort of uh, recognition, the vision of the single flower is something that becomes much more present uh, in all the pretty horses forward. Mm. Uh, and I'm, I suppose, known among my colleagues for reading uh, McCarthy, in spite of all this violence, as ultimately uh, offering a kind of measured redemption and hope. Uh, there's a good reason to embrace life in McCarthy, in spite of all the violence. But I think the idea with McCarthy is you, you we have to first begin understanding the nature of the world before we can embrace the world. And if, if we don't accept these fundamental stark realities, um, then we're always living in some kind of a fantasy and we can never fully live. That would be my sense of, of McCarthy's um, sort of ethic, if you will. Mm, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, the way he put it and the way you put it. Um, speaking of your academic colleagues, um, one of whom is Bill Hardwig. He's mm-hmm. an associate professor of English at the University of Tennessee, and he referred to um, Cormac McCarthy's uh, writing as, uh, he called it a fearless approach to writing does that statement resonate with you and can you give voice to what he means by by fearless it does bill's right about that i know him well and uh 
and the bills what bill is is referring to there because i've had conversations with him about that is he's he's talking about fearlessness in 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 i think two related but complementary contexts and that is that as as i've said a, a moment ago that mccarthy's fearless in confronting the world as it is so uh, it's there's a certain risk in embracing the darker aspects of of the world experience or the human experience, because you know there's something that that is protective about the fantasies fantasies we construct. In McCarthy's willingness to embrace uh, those darker realities, there's a fearlessness. But Bill also is referring uh, to his fearlessness as a uh, experimental writer. If you scrutinize his writing, you can see him trying new things stylistically, uh, in terms of vocabulary, in terms of various aspects of expression. Um, McCarthy is well known for being fairly unconcerned about how he's received uh, by an immediate reading public and more concerned with doing something important and valuable in a literary context. And so he's fearless in that he will throw out a phrase that perhaps we do not understand and cannot understand uh, and see if, uh, if he can use that phrase in such a way to cultivate. For example, what I would say is when McCarthy is not understandable, I think he's intentionally not understandable. And part of that is that he wants his writing to convey a sense of, of mystery which is characteristic of the world and being willing to, to be obtuse and, and to balance that with a certain direct clarity in expression to try out a certain kind of dark humor. That's, I think, uh, mainly what, what Bill is referring to. If I, if I, if I understand the conversations I had with him, he's really talking about an artistic fearlessness, especially. Now, isn't that a lesson for, so many of the writers out there. I mean, as an English professor, as a lit professor, don't you think that an awful lot of people out there who are attempting to be novelists, they tend to write like a novelist. They want to fit into the channel. They mm -hmm. want to fit. And they think too much about their audience rather than thinking, what is really inside me? What do I need to, to let out that's authentic to me? That uh, and, and people may relate to it or they may not relate to it. Yeah. But I think an awful lot of people wouldn't wouldn't get avant garde with the writing. They would just yeah. think, "I want to sound like the people who are selling books out there, or the right. person who I who I most admire." So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a a real lesson in that. You right. know, you speak in in for a good reason. You speak in very high tones about uh, Cormac McCarthy, and you know, he did win a Pulitzer Prize. He won a National Book Award. He won a lot of awards. Uh, was there an argument to be made for the Nobel Prize? Or is that maybe a bridge too far? Not at all. Uh, we, we've all expected and hoped uh, that that he would be and, and considered the possibility over the past 10 years that he might be uh, in the running for that. Make you know, the there, argument. Make the argument, because I, I know some of what you already said, I think, is part of the argument. But, but go yeah. ahead and synthesize that for us. Certainly. Certainly. I'd be happy to. Right. What what should the Nobel Prize be? It evolves over many years. Right. It, and and uh, different folks have won it for different kinds of things. But in principle, it should be about uh, authors who not only advance the literary tradition in such a way, re-envision the literary tradition in such a in, in, in a certain way, but also authors that engage those questions in a way that present the questions that we ask when we are six, seven, and eight years old. We sort of look up the stars or or are afraid in bed at night, right? We ask we're asking deep, profound philosophical questions, but um, the 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 great Nobel Prize winning author, someone like Faulkner, someone perhaps even like Hemingway, um, or someone certainly like Toni Morrison, they're asking those questions in such a way that when that when we read their works, we don't get the answers to the questions, but we get something that enriches us, perhaps comforts us, perhaps uh, leads us to grow in the act of asking. And in that sense, McCarthy, um, I, I just, you know, I've read a lot of contemporary literature. I haven't read it all, but I've read a lot. And when you look at some of the major authors, someone like Thomas Pynchon, someone like uh, um, Philip Roth, these are, are, are the people that that uh, would um, would would rival him in some ways. Don DeLillo as well. 
um, for the Nobel Prize. But I, I, I put my money on McCarthy for something like that because he is engaging in dealing with the human condition in a philosophical and broadly theological context. And you can't really have a human condition without those contexts, in my view, because we are the only entity out there, as far as we know, that uh, uh, either apprehends or, or has created in their own imagination something like a metaphysical absolute. Interesting. Now, uh, McCarthy's books did not have a lot of female characters. And I remember he was interviewed by Oprah Winfrey. Mm -hmm. And she said, ask him about that. She said, uh, you know, you don't have many women in your books. And uh, when she asked him, he said, I don't understand women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't understand them. Um, there's that. But then also when you're dealing with books that contain a lot of violence, uh, mm -hmm. men certainly trend towards violence a lot more than women do. Mm -hmm. Um, what, do you think that was part of it? Just that, look, I'm dealing with subject matter and, and it's the men who are out there um, doing this kind of really awful stuff in some cases, heroic stuff, but also awful stuff in, in, in many cases. What about the, uh, the, the, the lack of female characters in his books? And have you heard that as a criticism or is it simply that, look, the canvas he's painting on is lends itself to male characters and not nearly as much to female characters? I mean, what, what's your take on that? I think what you last said is has got a lot of truth to it. And and again, uh, you mentioned Bill Hardwig. I mentioned Diane Luce. In this context, I would mention Nell Sullivan uh, out of University of Houston uh, downtown. And Nell has done the best work that we have on McCarthy and, uh, and female characters. And Nell's contention um, is both critical and... Um, and and sympathetic right she 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 begins with the idea that mccarthy clearly doesn't render women as fully and as completely as they could be rendered and at the same time she explores contexts in which they are uh uh that he does make that attempt and, and achieve some level you know of success um i think the thing about mccarthy and women is the is it is it's the old adage. He writes about what he knows. And it's not that he doesn't understand women. Who knows what the heck that even means? I don't think he's particularly preoccupied with uh, with with gender dynamics in, in the same way that some other authors are. Um, and so in that sense, um, it's certainly true that he doesn't give equal or even close to equal weight to women. At the same time, he has some pretty powerful women characters and pretty sympathetic women characters. Um, I especially think of the Duane Alfonso in, in All the Pretty Horses. Um, I am, a, am an advocate for his rendering of the wife in um in the road uh she's the one who who commits suicide and abandons them and it can be read as an abandonment abandonment when you hear her highly sophisticated and pointed justification for what she does she ends up being the most powerful counterpoint to um to the man's attempt to find some meaning and purpose in that book and uh she becomes a formidable intellect in that context, where he doesn't necessarily uh, render them uh, perhaps the way we might expect or or uh, or even hope for, is getting at their affective life. Um, and I don't know. Uh, you know, I don't want to say a man can't do that. Uh, certainly, Larry McBurtry seemed to do it quite well, um, but it's perhaps just not McCarthy's forte. To what extent are McCarthy's books being used these days in English and literature departments? Are they prevalent? And uh, what do you think about their staying power in 50 or 100 years? Well, that's a that's a good question. And at the same time, a hard one to answer. Yes, they are being taught pretty widely, uh, particularly uh, books like Blood Meridian, All the Pretty Horses and The Road. Those are probably the ones that get the most um, the most treatment in the context of survey courses in literature, novel courses, courses in literature of the American West, certainly courses in literature of the American South. 
Um, what's hard to predict, Mike, about, about their staying power is that we don't understand or know how the culture will shift and change in terms of how it constitutes a canon or even what the academy is going to look like in 20, 30, 40, or 50 years. And so in that context, it's hard to predict. But if we were to assume some level of stability uh, in that in that context and, and assume that works of literature are um, are many things, including uh, works about a time and a place, works about a universal human condition, works about profound expression, works about the development of a tradition over time. Um, then he's tapping into all of those very, very important strands that constitute an aesthetic tradition. So I have a lot of confidence uh, in his um, in his staying power within the context of 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 the academy, um, depending upon where the academy goes in the context of humanistic study. I will say that one of the things we're going to have to figure out how to do, those of us that are are interested in preserving his legacy is to figure out how to get him anthologized because he's not typically anthologized in the major Norton Heath anthologies. And part of that is that he's not a short story writer. Um, so I think the road or all the pretty horses merits of finding their way in as complete novels, just as Huckleberry Finn does, uh, just as any number of other novels do. Uh, he'll need to have that or the segment out of or, or a segment out of the crossing. Um, he needs to be in those anthologies to be easily taught in survey courses. If somebody wasn't um, <clears throat> familiar with Cormac McCarthy, I, I think there's few few people out there at this point. But if they were not and they were looking for an entry point, which novel would you point them to? And also tell us which one is your favorite. And maybe they're one and the same. Well, you know, you're, you're speaking to two different guys in that context. So what I what I'll do is I'll be the, I'll be the guy who is who is just the, a thoughtful reader, um, and I'll give you the answer from from both of those perspectives uh, i would i would recommend all the pretty horses um and the reason i would recommend all the pretty horses over the road as an entry point is not that it's in quotes a better novel or whatever it's more characteristic of mccarthy's overall um body of work it's more stylistically characteristic it's more uh, oriented toward region it's more uh oriented toward uh toward adult characters interacting with one another as 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 they do in many of the novels. So you get, uh, you, when you read All the Pretty Horses, and then you go back and you read other works, particularly earlier works, or even forward a couple of novels, you're, you really feel like you're reading the same uh, author. The Road is recognizably McCarthy, but it's a departure uh, stylistically, uh, and and even in terms of some of his sensibilities. So All the Pretty Horses would be the first one that I would recommend to, to the person out there, uh, to your listeners. But I will say to, to the listener out there that is, that is more academically oriented and, and wants to read what we consider to be his masterpiece, that is the one with the most philosophical depth and the most uh, intensity is Blood Meridian. Uh, and so that's my favorite as a professor. Uh, that's the one I like to dig into and think about and write about more than All the Pretty Horses. But I got to tell you, I go back and read All the Pretty Horses fairly regularly. Did Cormac McCarthy ever say which of his novels he felt was his masterstroke or, or not? I don't believe so. And again, uh, you know, uh, others can will, will tell me at a conference if I'm, if I'm wrong about this. But no, uh, McCarthy is famous for not talking about his writing. Um, he didn't like to be interviewed, right? I mean, he did no. damn few interviews. What what Very what was his uh, explanation for that? Uh, what what can you tell us as to why he was so uh, taciturn when it came to to writing and so reclusive? Not it's, that it's unusual for writers to be reclusive. Right. His explanation, he said in the Oprah interview, he said it messes with your head. Um, he, his, his take is that when he cultivating a public persona, talking about his writing, hearing other people talk about his writing gets in the way of, um, of, his, uh, of his creative process. So it's, I think, something very personal. Now, I also think, and you're right, he's, his first interview was in 1992 with, uh, with the, the Woodward interview in the New York Times Magazine. 
that's pretty darn late when you consider he started writing in 1965 and had won any number of awards and had been received requests to not only for interviews, but for speaking engagements. My sense is that that he's he's being honest when he says all of that stuff can can kind of mess with your head or at least his head. My uh, my speculation also it has to do with the sort of mysteries of an individual personality. I just don't think he liked to speak, speak publicly. Uh, and I think in some of his few interviews that he has given, that reticence is obvious. I think he expresses himself well in those interviews, but there's a certain kind of shyness and discomfort that seems to me to be obvious. Um, and uh, and I I think that it's 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 personal in that sense. The uh, l- let me go on just for a minute and say that you remember that in 1992, when all the pretty horses came out, he had changed editors. Uh, and he had now moved, uh, he was no longer being, I think Erskine had died by that point, uh, but he was now being edited by Gary Fiskett-John uh, at Knopf. And Fiskett-John had a whole program for how to bring him into the public eye. Remember that that uh, before All the Pretty Horses, he had won Guggenheim's and Faulkner Fellowship Awards. He'd won the MacArthur Genius Grant, and yet none of his novels had sold more than 5,000 copies in hardback and they were out of print. You couldn't find them in bookstores. You would have to go to used bookstores to find his novels. So Fiskitron set about to to reinvigorate our understanding of him and I think convince McCarthy that he was going to have to participate in that a little bit. And so he very reluctantly did the Woodward interview and a couple of interviews after that, was always still reluctant to do it. but uh, but I think that's part of a of a, of a program that it, it it you know he he needed to to reinvigorate his public persona or at least his the the public's awareness of his work. Now he hails from Tennessee, hailed from Tennessee, but lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Any anything to say about his uh, choice of locale where he um, ended up finishing his life? Well, I mean, that's it was interesting. It was a recent interview, I believe it was with David Krakauer uh, of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, they talked about why he was in Santa Fe, and he was primarily in Santa Fe. That's that is specifically Santa Fe because uh, because of the Santa Fe Institute, where he was invited to become a fellow and uh, and ultimately a trustee. And he spent the last uh, couple decades of his life in residence there. Uh, he was actually asked, you know, uh, why Santa Fe, and he said. Uh, he goes, Santa Fe is not really his favorite place. He said he's it's a little too artsy for him, he said, which was interesting. Um, and so it's really the Santa Fe Institute that drew him specifically to Santa Fe, New Mexico. But he was drawn to the West when he began to research in the in the uh, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, when he began to research uh, Blood Meridian. And so he went there to 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 live and to research, and he moved first to El Paso, where he lived for for a number of years. So yeah, that's the Santa Fe sort of account, as best I understand it. Let's talk about your own novel. What is the title, and uh, what's the subject matter? What's it all about? And um, also, to to what extent uh, w- w- is your writing influenced by by Cormac McCarthy, or or, or perhaps you you're, you're taking a different path entirely? Oh um, no, not 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 entirely by any means. Yeah, my novel is is called uh, its title is Dogwood Crossing. Uh, it's based upon a family history, very very loosely based upon a, my own family history uh, of a family that migrated from uh, North Carolina, uh, Western North Carolina, to the French territory, what is now Southeast Missouri, and they did that in in 1798. Uh, so it was just before the Louisiana Purchase, still the French territory. And so it is a pioneer novel, a frontier novel that deals with a family's journey across these sort of exotic territories and all the things that they confront. And I'm trying to grapple with, you know, with uh, some aspect of of what we might call the American dream. This a father who is trying to, uh, you know, make something for his family uh, when he was a tenant farmer. Uh, so it's it's. It's, uh, it, that's the basic story. It's a journey narrative. It's a, a pioneer narrative. Uh, and I did a lot of, it doubles as a, as a, as a kind of cultural history because I do try to render the folklore and the folk culture as, as best I can. In terms of its influence, it was in, would be impossible for me to escape the influence of Cormac McCarthy in the context of writing a novel like that. And uh, I would say the influence is stylistic. Uh, 
uh, particularly uh, his use of, of polysyndeton, uh, that is the repetition of, of independent clauses with conjunction and. McCarthy draws that a lot from Hemingway, so my influence is not exclusively McCarthy, but Hemingway as well, and even Faulkner. Um, but I have been told by fellow McCarthy scholars who have read the novel, so are very familiar with McCarthy. Uh, one in particular, Scott Yarbrough, told me he he does the Mac reading McCarthy podcast. He said that what he thought he could, he could see the McCarthy influence, but he said in, that it was by no means a slavish influence; that it was not imitative. Uh, I, I, and I'm I'm pleased about that because it was a fear I had all along. Um, but yeah, that's the novel, uh, and um, and it's uh, it uh, it's it's out there doing its thing. And you wrote that how long ago? Uh, 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 I published it three years ago, and I've wrote it over a course of ten years. Before Are you that. working on another one? Oh, it took ten years to write it, or over the course of ten right. years anyway. It's a, it's a heavily researched novel. Plus, I was raising two kids. And Are you working on a, another novel? Uh, I'm not working on another novel at the moment. I'm working on a, an, another critical study that involves McCarthy, but isn't exclusively McCarthy. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm pondering a sequel to this novel um, because I do have one in mind, and that may, may be in my future. We'll see. Now, getting back to your colleague Bill Hardwig, he he also had said that each of, each of McCarthy's books typically departs radically in tone and structure uh, and prose from the previous one. But at the same time, it seems that that he's got a voice that that Cormac McCarthy developed a voice that is consistent throughout uh, his books. Do you see that or 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 not? Do you think he's got a, a voice that there, there's some consistency despite the the uh, uh, changes in in, uh, in in style? I I do, and I think Bill's right about that. I think that that if we think about, I I always like the term voice. Um, uh, even in contrast to the term style, because if you think about that, we drill down a little bit and we use uh, uh, and, and we think about, you know, your, you know, my console's voice, Steve Fry's voice. Uh, we know that that voice is different throughout the day, right? The tone changes, the emphasis changes, the affect changes, uh, even the styles of expression change, even as we move from one idiom to another. Um, uh, and yet, uh, when you speak or when I speak, the people that know us well enough know it's us speaking, even as we modulate through those various idioms. And um, that's how I would characterize McCarthy. He's not trying to be the same throughout, but there is this thread of sensibility, of style, of word choice, of expression. That's always him, even in novels like, for example, The Road, uh, or or No Country for Old Men, which are notable stylistic departures. When you read them, uh, if you're a McCarthy scholar and you didn't have a name and you were handed five books um, and with no names on them and you read the five and were asked which one is McCarthy, you would pick out the road, um, even though you would acknowledge how much of a departure it is in terms of that voice. Hmm. Now, he is renowned for as a, as an author who wrote a lot of short sentences. Was was that something that was overemphasized the the use of short sentences, or is that really very much part of his signature style? Well, it's part of the uh, it's part of 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 that sort of varying idiom. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily characterize him in in terms of in you know he he can sometimes be. You know, for many, many years, uh, he was, uh, I think, excessively compared to Faulkner for, for good reasons, but but that that influence was overemphasized. And the influence that was not um, uh, a sort of considered enough was that of Hemingway. Um, and I think part of this, this, this um, focus on his tendency at times to write uh, very, very short sort of declarative sentences is the late recognition of that influence. Um, but by no means would I characterize him in that way. Um, his style is much more varied, uh, and you find that that what you what you do find in McCarthy is the use of parallelisms. That is uh, a, a tendency not to write uh, uh, subordinated sentences. That's a departure from uh, from Faulkner, who subordinated a lot, particularly in some of his signature novels like *The Sound and the Fury*. Um, so no short sentences, uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be the thing that would characterize him, although it is a feature of his work. 
you know, if you were to identify <clears throat> um, McCarthy's, uh, this might not even be a fair question, but his number one strength, uh, when you think in terms of pacing or characterization or um, uh, 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 just being able to um, detail a scene or set a mood, is there any particular aspect his writing that you thought was transcendent, that this this was was really the tip of the spear? Well, I, I think under the under the broad category of expression, what I would say, if we wanted to, again, drill down a little bit on that, I would say his ability to effectively orchestrate a long sentence. Um, and Faulkner is able to do that in a very different way. But the idea that he can embody a scene by bringing you in without excessive punctuation um, and actually make the scene more accessible See, we often, you know, writing teachers will often emphasize the need for punctuation in order to make uh, make the writing accessible. McCarthy makes the writing accessible by avoiding much of that, particularly commas. He said, why fill up the page with all these funny little marks? <laughs> and and I think, yeah. that, you know, and I think that that's that's his ability to orchestrate a long sentence to bring you into a scene or into a consciousness uh, in, at times is, I think, his biggest, one of his biggest strengths, certainly. So he, um, um, his first name it actually was not Corm, uh, Cormac, is my understanding. He was originally named, is it, was it Charlie? It was Charles, yeah. He was named after his father. Uh, and so I don't remember, I should, I should know, but sometime pretty early on, he changed that, uh, to Cormac, which is, I believe Charles, uh, in, in a, a, some sort of a Gaelic dialect. Uh, and, um, so he, he changed his name and didn't change his name. And, you know, who the heck knows, knows why there's, there's, uh, the most obvious, some people have said, you know, he, he had issues with his father and, and all of that. I, I, I don't know about that. I don't think there's a lot that we, we do know about that. Uh, I think, I think, you know, I, none of us at that time would want to be Charlie McCarthy. Um, yeah, that's true. It also is much more, <laughs> Cormac is actually very distinctive. Yeah, it is. Right. So, so that, that's McCarthy a plus. A puppet, so I think maybe not that guy. So he also spent time in the military. He was in the Air Force. Um, any any uh, anything to say about that? Just in terms of um, whether that had um, a very significant influence on him. I think of James Salter, and James Salter was in the military. He loved the military. He was, mm -hmm. in fact, he came to a, a point in his life where he was trying to decide: Do I want to spend a career in the military or become, be a writer? And um, obviously, he chose to be a writer, but he uh, was very influenced by by the military. Do you see mil military influence in, in Cormac McCarthy? Was there any uh, in insight to offer on that? Well, certainly the male centered world um, and the military was ma very male centered, perhaps still is to a large extent. Uh, when McCarthy was was uh, in the military, he was in the Air Force uh, shortly after it became the Air Force uh, and he was stationed in Alaska. Um, I don't know that we know a lot about the particular details of how he, he lived in the military. We do know that he at some point said that's where he really started engaging in, in, in very intense reading. It was after his experience. He was in college. He left, went into the military and came back to the same university, University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Um, and so he clearly came back sort of supercharged by the reading that he had done. Uh, in terms of, of uh, uh, his work, um, perhaps, you know, it's often said that the American novel generally is very preoccupied with work, uh, men working, and that is uh, certainly characteristic of McCarthy. And insofar as the military is about things like discipline and hard work and, um, and those kinds of, of uh, even manual labor, uh, I think that, 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 that could be, I don't know if that comes from his, his uh, time in the military, maybe partly so. It also comes from his exposure to uh, the working class culture of uh, of Appalachia, where he grew up. Let's uh, walk through the three McCarthy books that you wrote. I believe they go in this order. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's Cormac McCarthy and Context, the, Ca uh, the Cambridge Companion to Cormac McCarthy, and then most recently, Understanding Cormac McCarthy. Is, is that the proper order? No, and I need to add one. Um, oh. Yeah, I have a new book. Yeah, it, it just came out. So the order is understanding Cormac McCarthy first, then 
uh, a couple of years later, the Cambridge Companion to Cormac McCarthy. Then uh, a number of years later, uh, Cormac McCarthy in context. And then just this last year, uh, April 2023, I published a book with University of Alabama Press called Unguessed Kinships, uh, Naturalism and the Geography of Hope in Cormac McCarthy. Uh, so that's my most recent. Uh, the uh, the um, understanding of Cormac McCarthy is meant to be sort of a foundational, broad treatment uh, of, of McCarthy's, all of McCarthy's works. My latest uh, is a focus on the way in which he embodies and is potentially uh, conditioned by some of the late 19th century writers that we associate with a literary naturalism. Um, so that's the order. Um, dates, 2009, Understanding, 2013, uh, Cambridge Companion, 2020, um, uh, Cormac McCarthy in Context, and 2023, Unguessed Kinships. So Cormac McCarthy in context. Uh, tell us about that book. What's the what's the focus? Well, that's a Cambridge University Press volume. It's a part of a series uh, that they call Authors in Context, and the idea, and this is what distinguishes it from the other Cambridge volume, that is the Companion, is that it's less focused on dealing on doing close textual readings of the author's work, and more focused on various kinds of of broader um, historical, cultural, and intellectual context. So there's an, uh, a, an article on science, there's an article on the South, there's an article on the Romance tradition, uh, there's an article on the archives. Um, and so it's a, it's a fine series, really, if you're interested in the various currents that might be uh, influencing any given author. And, and so there's, there, it's Cormac McCarthy in context is one of them, but there is Hemingway in context, there is Faulkner in context, there's Toni Morrison in context. Uh, so that's the purpose of, of, the, of the volumes, yeah. Gotcha. So did you ever have an opportunity to meet uh, Cormac McCarthy and to spend time talking with him? I know he didn't like to do media interviews, but I'm wondering if he was amenable to meeting with say, a professor like you, with the idea in mind that, look, I'm, this is not something that's going to show up in a newspaper or magazine. Uh, it, this is for an understanding. I'm, I'm looking for background. I'm looking for um, some uh, just to understand you and your writing more deeply, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously you would be thinking in terms of maybe eventually putting that in a book or certainly uh, using it in a classroom. Uh, but it's less confrontational than 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 a newspaper magazine article showing up and right. and him feeling like my God that's what they emphasize why you know why did I do this interview to begin with right well unfortunately I was never lucky enough to have the opportunity to to, to meet uh, McCarthy I have had the opportunity to meet and interact with his brother Dennis uh, and um, who is a wonderful wonderful man a novelist himself he wrote a book about Billy the Kid. Um, uh, and so, you know, I, I got got a little bit of a sense, although we didn't sort of talk much about about McCarthy. Few have had that opportunity, but some have. Uh, some people that are my contemporaries, for various reasons, have found themselves uh, being able to have uh, have some time with him over a, over a meal. And I'm told uh, I'm told that he is. I think uh, what has been confirmed. Uh, is is uh, Richard Woodward's uh, phrase, which is gregarious loner. Uh, apparently, <laughs> he's he's a, a very uh, interesting, uh, fascinating interlocutor, and willing to to talk not so much about his writing. Uh, he doesn't really want to talk about that, but he wants to talk to people about ideas and and, and issues. Um, and so, yeah, there's been a few people that I know that have had that opportunity, but I unfortunately wasn't one of them. What about the end of his career he ended with a, a novel called the passenger and actually came out with two right back to back is that is that right uh, Stephen? the passenger and Stella Maris yes talk about those um how just as career enders do you do you feel that his work was um still at a high level or did you see kind of the 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 wear of of time and age at play no, I would never say that, that I saw the, the wear of time and age at play. And, and you know, I'm still sort of reeling with uh, with my reading of those those novels. But when I read them, um, I was 
very pleased. And I thought that they represented a sort of remarkable coda and synthesis of, may, of many of his concerns. Uh, he's still, uh, he's writing in a more minimalist style than he did in something like Blood Meridian, more like or more in the style of his late work, which is fine. Um, but, you know, he grapples with his, he's, he, he does in those two novels, what he's done throughout his career, he's very consistent. And that is that those are novels that are coalescing many of his concerns, considerations, and the intellectual life that he experienced at the Santa Fe Institute. So they're preoccupied with the philosophical implications of mathematical study, the philosophical implications of physics and science. Uh, and he does, does, and he, we have to remember that he was writing those novels for, for a couple of decades. They were a couple of decades in the works. Um, so uh, and he, he's, he's known for writing, sometimes writing novels in parallel with one another. But no, um, I was very pleased. I, I actually uh, just, I got a copy of both The Passenger and Stella Maris because I'm on the editorial board of the Cormac McCarthy Journal. And so we got a review copy and we're able to read it in advance of its actual publication. And um, I, I was impressed enough with both of them that, um, that I immediately wrote an article and, and submitted it for publication. So it'll be coming out next year. Uh, and it, they're just so rich intellectually uh, and still so stylistically strong that, that I'm a strong advocate for them. I will say just, just as a point of, point of interest to your listeners that we don't know their, their history. There is, a, we, all we heard about for decades was the passenger. And then all of a sudden, what was announced was the release of two novels. So we don't know whether Stella Maris is in fact something that was supposed to be woven into the passenger as part of that novel or whether or not um, it was uh, a, a, some kind of addendum. I think the the assumption probably is that what he had was a, a, a novel that they decided to excise Stella Maris from because Stella Maris is stylistically very different. Stella Maris is about a woman, uh, and it's it's a it's a novel long uh, dialogue between a woman and her and her psychiatrist. Uh, and the the passenger is about um, her brother uh, and and his memories of her. Um, and I'm not giving anything away when I say that she ultimately commits suicide because that happens on the first page of the passenger. So the very first page, you know, that's 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 leading up to it so no spoiler uh, there uh, so i i think that uh that they're they're remarkable stylistically and formally uh and uh i would say that not all of us in the mccarthy community but most of us or many of us i'll say uh were very very pleased with what we what we received and and are reading them over and over again what kind of relationship did he have with his editor do you have any insight into that uh, is he the kind of guy who didn't like being edited. I mean, most writers are not big fans of being edited. Uh, was he um, uh, real protective of the work in its in its uh, virgin form, or did he ever express that his work was that there was that there was a um, enhancement to being edited by you? Me you mentioned his his, his uh, later editor. Uh, what was that name again? Uh, Gary Fiskett, John. Yeah. What can you tell us about his uh, interactions with his editor, if, if you know anything at all, considering how, well, again, know, how reclusive he was? Yeah, I know less about his interaction with Fiskett, John. And again, what I would what I would credit Diane Luce for being able to account for all of those relationships in a very thorough way, particularly early on. But my sense in reading his interactions with uh, in, in the archives with uh, with a number of of, uh, of of people, but particularly Erskine, is that there was, uh, I don't know how I would characterize it except to say uh, a very productive relationship. He didn't just accept the edits that Erskine gave to him, but he didn't summarily reject them either. There was, I think, a genuine dialogue and a genuine sort of processing of aesthetic and formal considerations that they both had. Because Erskine, I don't think I mentioned before, was William Faulkner's editor. So this is an editor of avant-garde American writers. And so uh, he was in many ways, uh, Erskine that is, many ways ideal to edit McCarthy, who was going to attempt some of some um, 
was going to also attempt to be uh, formally kind of innovative and interesting in that way. So it was really kind of a magical relationship in the sense that he was the perfect person to edit McCarthy. And McCarthy was resistant, I think, enough, but not uh, not so much that he didn't benefit from Erskine. And I would imagine, you know, in, in as he was developing as a writer in those early years, probably more editorial influence than later with Fiskett John. Um, but uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I he had by that time had learned how to work with an editor uh, and and negotiate that relationship. To what degree uh, was Cormac McCarthy um, aware of his legacy, have awareness of his legacy? And, and, and to what degree was he protective of that? Yeah, I, I, in many ways, we don't know. Um, but at the same time, we can judge from his uh, his unwillingness. I mean, certainly we know that throughout his life, he wanted to write for the screen. He 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 was not opposed to being read and being uh, popular. Um, but at the same time, um, when you look at the kind of works that he sets about to write, they are works that are shooting for a legacy. And so I don't know if I'd call him protective of his legacy, but certainly cognizant of it, writing to have a legacy, writing to be culturally significant and uh, in, in a human sense significant. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in the, I, I don't know that, I don't know how much he was concerned with what people were writing about him. And I have every, uh, I suppose, belief that he wasn't out there reading our books or our commentaries, mainly because he would say that they would mess with his head. But I don't think that he was necessarily opposed to, in fact, I think he was, I, I, I think, and some of my colleagues may argue with me, but I think that he was writing in many ways for posterity and therefore uh, conscious and even hopeful that um that uh that people would take him up in an academic context and i know that he was aware of of the society and there was never anything uh that uh and there was a few comments a few times that people met him at a play i think at the sunset limited uh and so there was a i think a fair um you know kind of respect for what we did even if it was a distanced respect if you will our guest has been Stephen Fry, a novelist, a college professor, Cormac McCarthy scholar. He's written three published books on the subject. He's got a fourth one coming on Cormac McCarthy. Uh, and again, uh, written his own novel called Dogwood Crossing. If you look in the episode notes, you will see a link to Stephen Fry's website where you can learn a lot more about him, as well as a link to the Cormac McCarthy website if you want to dig more deeply into that. Stephen, this has been really interesting. I appreciate the depth of knowledge you have about Cormac McCarthy, and I, I really uh, appreciate you coming on the program. Well, it was a pleasure, Mike. I appreciate you having me.